What is up, YouTube? I am Taylor. Welcome back to my channel, and this is my review of Black Hammer, the Library Edition, Volume 1, by Jeff Lemire and Dean Ormston, with uh, assistant art on some of the issues, and uh, coloring by Dave Stewart, and lettering by Todd Klein. Um, the volume itself is fantastic. It's a, it's a, it's a beef, beefy big boy, uh, with a, with a little... Library paper binder -y thing, whatever this is called. Clothy thing. It's a technical term. Bookmark! I'm, yeah, there we go. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it, my copy's beat up. It, it, it got dinged up because I ordered from Amazon. Never order big old things from Amazon, books from Amazon. I know they started off as a company that were shipping books to it, and they destroyed bookstores, and they're evil, and they're taking over the world. But they can't ship books for shit. They just throw like this in a cardboard box with like one piece of bubble thing, and it bangs all over, and it gets all banged up, and whatever. Uh, I am not giving this away one away. I'm keeping it because, well, it's a big boy, <laughs> and uh, I want it, and I'm gonna read the rest of the series. It's got uh, you know a, a paper cover like we used to do in grade school because I'm old, and uh, the inside, the interior covers this matches, so I can just take this off for the review, and it'll look pretty much the same. Uh, the paper quality is fantastic. It's a coated paper stock. Uh, the colors really pop on it, uh, even though they're kind of a muted palette for the most part. But, you know, it's not bright and garish like some of the other older volumes and reprints of comics were. This is, I think this started in 2014 officially, maybe to maybe a little bit later. But, uh, so they, they had sort of figured out digital coloring by 2016. So by then, they've, they've really gotten a handle on digital coloring. And Dave Stewart's a master of it. And he knows what he's doing with the paper stock and stuff. So he, you know, it, it's not the, the garish, bright reprints of old comics of, of, of yore. Uh, and, and, yeah, it's a thick paper stock. I, you know, well printed. The gutters are, are well lined up. It's all, it's all sewn bound in there. I can't remember what that kind of binding's called. Because, well, I... Took a book binding class like twenty some years ago, and I'm fucking old. Part of my language. Um, yeah, it's the the volume itself is quality. There's uh, at the end at the end there's some uh, reproductions of the original art with the the pasted in lettering of by Dean and some of the color some black and white uh, versions of the covers, which is great. The this this reprints issues one through thirteen of the Black Hammer series and the annual. The first annual, and uh, it, it's got a, um, and uh, I'm just explaining what the extra stuff is in here. Not a ton. I mean, it's got some of the original character concepts by Jeff Lemire and Dean, and and it, how they evolved and stuff. And uh, yeah, but the, the, it's a solid, well put together volume itself. Now, as far as the book goes, let's get into it, huh? Spoilers, spoilers, spoilers. Try not to explain, spoil the whole plot, but I'm gonna have to give some stuff away here. Uh, because, well, and you'll, you'll sort of get this right off the bat if you decide to read this. Black Hammer follows these Golden Age and Silver Age heroes that got together to fight this giant monster called the Anti-God. And they beat the Anti-God and then they, boom, flash of light, they woke up on some farm and they're trapped there. In a small town where the, the world doesn't know of superheroes, there's no internet. Uh, and they've been there a decade when the story starts. And and that's kind of the, the start of the tale. The characters themselves are sort of a combination of DC and Marvel and timely comics and some of those old archetypes or those old heroes. There's Golden Gale, who's like a sort of a reverse Shazam or Captain Marvel back. Doesn't matter. Shazam. We'll go for Shazam. It's easier. When she says the word Zaphram, she transforms from her real age of a middle-aged woman to a nine-year-old girl with superpowers. Unfortunately, in the world of Black Hammer and on this farm, she's trapped in the body of a nine-year-old girl. So she's a middle-aged woman in a, nine, in a nine-year-old girl's body, swears like a sailor, drinks like a fish, but in order to like keep appearances and stuff, has to keep going to school and repeating like third grade or whatever the heck grade nine-year-olds are in. Whatever. Timing, age, hard. I don't have kids. Whatever. Uh, and, and so like she's really struggling with the being trapped here. She, and, and most of the characters are struggling and then there's I mean they're all have their own struggles but some are more visible and some are more apparent at first and some like get slowly revealed to the course of this volume uh, anyways Abraham Slam is sort of a Captain America figure uh, mixed with a little bit of nah not really Batman but he doesn't have any superpowers he's just a boxer that put on a costume and slams people he's he's the aged 
hero of the bunch. You know, kind of outdid, uh, you know, probably had outlasted his heroic usefulness in the real world, and now he's the father figure on the farm. Kind of enjoys it here, actually. He's dating a waitress for part for this, and uh, you know, there's struggles and stuff. But he he's mo the most well adjusted, and at least on the surface, is the the most accustomed and, and liking this farm life. Uh, then there's also Colonel Weird. Uh, and and his uh, robot companion, uh, the female robot Talkie Walkie, uh, Colonel Weird's kind of a Flash Gordon figure, and Talkie Walkie is a female like uh, not Forbidden Planet kind of age, not, you know, retro sci-fi 1950s robot and 1950s space explorer, where you can, you know you could go to space wearing nothing but a bubble and a jetpack and a bikini or whatever, and you'd be fine. That's the Colonel Weird, and uh, and yeah, the name fits. He's the oddest character probably in this volume. Uh, you're not really clear what's going on with him. He's ages and de-ages as you, as you meet him in this series. And uh, he just pops in and out of existence and then uh, also goes to another realm that I can't remember the name of. Parazone, Paris, something like that. So it's, it, it's really trippy and definitely playing off the mystery and space stuff and the old golden and silver age sci-fi elements. Uh, I think he's like unstuck in time and has bits and pieces of the visions of the future and the present and doesn't really seem to realize when or where he is. All the time, and he has these doorways he can go in and out of that like give him peaks and stuff. He's one of the, like I said, more mysterious characters of the bunch, and his motives are kind of unclear. He does some things in the volume that don't seem great, and I'm not sure if there's a reason for that yet. But uh, we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, and Barbalian, who is a straight Martian manhunter type character, who also happens to be a, a identify as a gay man, <laughs> and. And uh, his struggles as a gay man living in a small town where that's not necessarily accepted. And as a Martian, so he's doubly alien, as it were. and uh, Or feels doubly alien, not... Yeah, feels doubly alien. And then there's uh, Madame Dragonfly, who is sort of a witch... The witch figure sprouts wings, um, sort of the House of Secrets, House of Mystery kind of uh, character, Elvira-ish, who will uh, break, break the fourth wall and talk to the reader at least at certain points, and lives in her own cabin. And this cabin has superpowers and, you know, different haunted rooms and all and whatnot. So those are the main players at first. There's a character introduced in this volume that I don't want to, like, spoil. But that, that character, I, I think, is uh, definitely has significance and is going to play a greater role as the whole series goes on. And, and that character is also involved in a, as a, in a cliffhanger ending to this volume. Uh and that's not a complaint, uh, the, the cliffhanger ending. It, I, I kind of enjoy cliffhanger endings at times. Uh, and this this is one of those times because it's an intriguing enough story with intriguing enough characters that I'm I, by the time I got to this, I, I was pretty heavily invested in what was happening to them. So I'm curious to see where it goes next. And it's it's already finished, this, this part of Black Hammer. There's a Black Hammer universe that Jeff Lemire has created. And, like, there's new stories that are being told and that and stuff. So if you dive on into the Black Hammer world now, you might be maybe a little lost, but he, he does a trying to go to, outside of the volume. I don't, I don't want to review the entire Black Hammer universe. It's too big. But like you can pick up newer comics that are coming out that are in the Black Hammer world. Uh, so, if you, But if you wanted a full idea of what actually happened and, and, and the start of the universe, this is where it starts, is in this Black Hammer library edition. Or... The single issues, if you if you want to pay the money and collect those, uh, yeah. So these characters, they beat the anti god. They all come together in like the sixties or seventies, I think. I, it, the time is kind of unclear. The internet does exist in the current day, but they 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 beat these characters and then they end up trapped on this farm and they're there for ten years. And so we meet these characters ten years in, and they're all coping to various degrees as far as like how they're surviving and how frustrated they are and what they're trying to do to get out of there or whether or not they resign themselves to the fate. And most of the characters are actively trying to escape. Some are not. And some are trying to do things that maybe they are trying to escape, but it doesn't appear like that on the surface. They're act, they, there's there's hints and things that like a couple of these main characters have different motives and are working against some of these other characters. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of... You could tell there's a love of superheroes in this book, and that Jeff Lemire loves the Golden Age and Silver Age stories. It, it, it's kind of evident across this page, these pages, and, and the covers, and all that stuff. And Dean Armstrong is an in interesting artist, too, as far as, like, picking up most of this. He's not a super heroic or super action-oriented artist. His, his art is fairly straightforward and s somewhat sparse. 
kind of reminds me of Mike Mignola, not quite as heavy on the shadow, uh, lighter line work. Um, the characters generally have like smaller facial features on a big head, so they, they kind of look a little uh, grotesque in a good way. And, and uh, yeah, it's... You know, and the panel design and transition is all very easy to follow. There's like never, there was never a point in this book where I was, very, where I was confused as far as the action, especially when Dean Armstrong was right, was drawing it. A couple of fill-in artists aren't quite as strong, and uh, you know, I don't want to talk crap about the fill-in artists. They, they did a competent job, but there were no Armstrong. Armstrong, it seems like this is his baby, and the reason there were fill-in artists, it turns out, is he had a brain hemorrhage uh, while drawing in the process of drawing this book, and had to relearn how to use the right side of his body and to relearn how to draw. And that's just kind of crazy. And, and like, his art didn't lose a step from what I can tell. And so, like, I, I read an interview where he was pretty frustrated and then, like, said he woke up for months crying that he couldn't hold a pencil. And that's that would be rough. Um, I can empathize a little bit. Uh, but, yeah, he uh, his art is solid and strong whenever he's in charge. And, then, and the, the other artists are competent. The, the two, uh, two issues where there's other artists and then the annual where there's a bunch of artists that jump in. They're not quite as strong, but they're they're decent. Uh, so yeah, these characters all feel trapped, and uh, you know, and, and there's a lot of small moments in this book. It's like big heroes living small lives <laughs> and and living in a place they don't want to be. I don't know if it's a metaphor for a midlife crisis, so but that's kind of how I'm taking it. It's sort of like these characters, their lives have not gone to hell they planned. Especially like the most obvious is the golden is Golden Gale because she. You know, outside of this world is a fifty-something-year-old lady uh, that's had a you know life and is middle aged but now she's trapped as a nine-year-old and has been a nine-year-old for ten years, and so she's really struggling. Uh, and yeah, that's but all of them are struggling in their own way. Like Abraham Slam on the surface is the happiest, like I said, but he uh, he has his inner struggles and trying to like cope and date and come to grips with aging himself and and just trying to come to grips with. You know, what is the, the downward slope of his life? A barbalian, an alien on a strange planet, uh, in, a, in a place that's not super accepting. And there's that struggle. And then uh, the Madam Butterfly is probably the most mysterious. But you learn in here why, why like, that she too is going through loss and pain and sorrow and feeling trapped. And Colonel Weird is maybe the outlier because he, he'd had a full golden age adventure space life going through galaxies and stuff. And he still seems to be doing some of that, but he's, he's a sympathetic character. He's not a happy person and not in, always in control of his facilities. It, it seems like. And so he, uh, he too is trapped in a way in, in several ways. So that's, that's the overall theme of this is, is a sense of trapped and, and w wanting to escape. And and I and it it could rel you know can relate to life in that way. Uh, do I recommend this? Oh yeah, yeah, heavily, highly. It's it's great. Uh, it, it pays homage to, to the Golden and Silver Age heroes, but it tells a modern story. And Lemire's great at this kind of thing. I I know I've reviewed maybe more Lemire than anything else. I haven't looked, but I know I tend to review a lot of his stuff because he's a very good writer. <laughs> and uh, this is this is no exception. This is probably. Yeah, I'll say this thus far. This is my favorite piece of thing I've read by him, and I'm really looking forward to getting volume two at some point and reading the ending and or the ending of this chapter of Black Hammer. Uh, why it's called Black Hammer, you find out in in, in the volume. I don't want to spoil it. And uh, yeah, that's that's kind of I, I don't want to keep going on this. I could. I mean, I could probably ramble on this for hours about like you know that each issue and like they they either each issue sort of does. It's first it, like spotlight a different character and and like the goes through their struggles and then it tells the whole story. There's an A story and a B story and like the there's the the forces trying to work to keep them in this place and, the, and the, they're, then they're all trying to figure out what's wrong and why they are on the farm and then there's an outside force trying to help and yeah it's it's an intriguing mystery and and it's melancholy it's moody it's there are action moments but they're not the highlight of this book and it and it's like not telling bombastic superhero stories, it's telling the small tales of these figures. And and so, if you're down for that, I really highly recommend it. I know it's been optioned and it forever, and there's talks of a TV series, and Lemire has said that he would really like Ron Perlman to play Abraham Slam, and other folks are like, oh, Doug Jones can be the Barbalian, because Doug Jones is the only person ever, apparently, that can do makeup and be awkward and tall and gangly, which is Barbalian. 
uh, yeah, it's. I I think it'd be a fantastic TV series, but I don't think like it's not it's not the boys, it's not Jupiter's Legacy, it's not any of those like high powered, you know, superhero stories. It would be more of like if AMC were to tell a superhero story. It's a slow burn. It's a unraveling and an unfolding, uh, you know, and and it's a character exploration. So like it, it it's not. It's not a beat em up action fest. It's not a slug fest. It's not any of those things. But yeah, I think if in the right hands, it'd be a fantastic series. But I, I, judging this on its own merit, it holds up. Like I don't, I don't read things with like because of like oh I want to see this in other media. I read comics because I love comics, and this is written and drawn by people that love comics, and and it helps. You. Yeah, like it, it, it's kind of like if you if you're feeling down on superhero books and you're feeling down on like the joy and enthusiasm that can go into the creation of comics, I'd recommend giving this a read. So, there you have it. Uh, that's all I got. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you go. Um, you know, if you're going through a midlife crisis, read Black Hammer and don't be a dick about it. See ya.